بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر أو أنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد In the past several years a change has occurred in the West in Canada in the United States in Europe, in Australia, in New Zealand. This change has taken the West by storm. There's talk of gender, choosing your gender, identifying your gender. Now, this is not something new that occurred in 2022. No, it's been on the scene for a while, for several years now. And this didn't happen overnight the talk of gender. There are events that led to this transformation or the transgender movement. As we mentioned two nights ago, that the sexual revolution had major impact, had, had a major impact. We saw as a result of the sexual revolution, many things that were previously banned or considered taboo, today they're accepted. They're part of society, something very normal. Part of this is the talk regarding gender, identifying with a specific gender. A man can choose to be a woman, or a woman can choose to be a man. Or you choose to be neither a man nor a woman. And there was talk of sexuality as well. Which do you conform to? being heterosexual or homosexual, a man or a woman. Of course, my dear friends, this talk of gender is a modern construct. This is something relatively new. It didn't exist 100 years ago. It didn't exist 200 years ago. If you read the works of Aristotle or Socrates or Plato, you won't find anything regarding gender. They didn't say anything about gender. Nor did John Locke, the founder of democracy, or David Hume, or the famous Western philosophers. It's a modern construct. It's something new. It's a byproduct of modernity. 
this talk of the sexual revolution, of gender. It's a byproduct of many events and transformations that occurred in the West, specifically in Europe. For example, the church reformation, the reformation that took in church, the refusal of dogma, individualism that we will talk about in a couple of moments. All of these events that led to modernity, that brought us to where we are today, we see its results in the sexual revolution and in the talk about gender. What is new is that it has entered schools, my children's schools and your children's schools. They're teaching our children today about gender. And that you can choose your gender. You could be a male, but you identify as a woman. You could be a female, but you can identify as a man. They're teaching our children. Imagine this, children that are innocent. They're born in innocence. With fitra, they're being taught that you don't have to accept the gender that you've been given by society or what your parents tell you. You could be a, a boy by birth, but you can choose to be a woman. Or you were born as a female by birth, but you can choose to be a man. This is where it becomes complicated. This is where it becomes chaotic and it becomes problematic and even dangerous. Why? Because they're confusing our children. Our boys and girls are being confused in school into learning how to choose their gender. Here, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to clarify. What does Islam say regarding the topic of gender? Is there gender in Islam? Or is there gender fluidity? Can you pick and choose your gender? Or do you stick to the gender that you were given at birth, which is your sex? At birth, male or female, that is your gender. Or can you pick and choose? And thirdly, does Islam recognize gender roles? Has Islam prescribed any roles for men, any roles for women? And are those roles a prescription, merely a prescription, or are they obligatory? That is what we will discuss, inshaAllah. Wa sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They say in the transgender movement, and they're very active, they're, they're very political, they push for their agenda. They say there's a difference between sex and gender. What is the difference between sex and gender? Sex is what you're born with. You're either a male or female at birth. That is determined at the time of birth. And it relies on your reproductive organs Depending on your organs, you're either given, you're assigned the sex of male or a female. Gender is man and woman. Gender has nothing to do with your reproductive organs. It has nothing to do with the sex assigned to you at birth. Gender is how you feel. Gender is your identity. Which gender do you align yourself with? Are you a man? Or you're a woman. You could be a male by sex, but you identify as a woman. And you have the right to identify as a woman. That's your identity. Or you could be born as a woman. That's your sex. But you identify with the male gender, with men. And that is why you hear them say, a lot of them, part of the transgender movement, you hear them say that I'm a woman, but I'm stuck in a man's body. Or I'm a man, but I'm stuck in a woman's body. What does that mean? That means that they feel there's a difference between their sex and their gender. She's a woman. Her sex is a woman, but she identifies as a man. She feels that she's a man. Or the other way around. So it depends on their feeling, as they say. What do I feel? What, if I, what do I identify with? So they say that a person cannot choose their sex at birth. You're either born as a male or you're born as a female. 
That you cannot change, but you can change your gender from a man to a woman or from a woman to a man. That is in your hands. You have the capacity to change your gender. In fact, they say that, you know, choose the gender that you're most comfortable with. In the morning, you could be a man. In the evening, you could be a woman. It's as simple as that. It's what you feel and what you feel more most comfortable with, you choose your identity. And you get to pick the pronouns that you feel are comfortable. And, and you see this today in schools. You go for a job interview. You work at a company. They tell you what's your preferred pronoun, your pronoun of preference. Would you like us to call you he, she, they, or other? Or other. You don't want to be called he. You don't want to be called she. And you don't want to be called they. At the end of the day, they say it's your body, it's your liberty, it's your privacy, it's your identity, and it's your happiness. Choose what makes you happy, whether you'd like to be a man or a woman, or you'd like to change over time. For some time you want to be a man, and then after a while you want to be a woman. And then you'd like to go back to being a man. You have the right because it's your identity. No one else can tell you what you want to be. No one can tell you what, you what your identity is. No one has the right. It is only your right to identify with the gender that you feel most comfortable. And they say gender is fluid. What do they mean by gender is fluid? That means that when you grow up, you feel... Because you're a male and you have male organs and you were told that you're a male, you're a man. So in the beginning you feel like you're a man. But after a couple of years, no, you decide to identify with women. You begin to identify with women. And so you change your gender. And that's where gender becomes fluid. You change over time from a man to a woman. This is what they say. This is what they claim. And then maybe after a while, you can go back to becoming a man. And here's where fluidity comes on stage. Or gender is non-binary. You don't have to specifically be a man nor a woman. It's not binding upon you. It's non-binary. Every day you can pick and choose. Depending on how you feel. Depending on what you identify with, it's non-binary. So if one day you say you're a man... You don't have to stick with it till the day of judgment. No. After a while, after a couple of weeks, after a couple of months, after a couple of years, you can change and so on and so forth. Or if you don't want to, you don't even need to associate with a specific gender. You don't have to be a man and you don't have to be a woman. This is what they claim. They also claim that gender is a social construct. What do we, what do, what do we mean by social construct they say that to be a man or to be a woman this is something that society tells you what does it mean to be a man being a man is feeling masculine not crying being brave wearing a suit wearing a tie wearing pants this is what defines a typical man correct who defines man in a in this way society Society tells men to behave in a certain way, to dress in a certain way, to push away their emotions, not to cry, and so on and so forth. And to be a woman, what does it mean to be a woman? To be a woman is to wear a dress or to wear a skirt, to be kind, to stay at home, to cook, to clean, to take care of their children. That's what it means to be a woman. But who tells women to be that way? Society. And hence, it's a social construct. Society tells men to behave in a certain way and for women to behave in another way. And at the end of the day, we don't have to accept everything that society tells us. We can go above. We can go beyond. This is not dogma. It's not like church is telling us. No, it's society. It's a social construct. We can be rebellious and reject that which society tells us to do, whether it's being a man or being a woman. A person can choose to do whatever they'd like to do. My dear friends, as I just mentioned, that this movement, the transgender movement, it didn't come overnight. It's not like we slept 
at night and we woke up in the morning and there was a movement called the transgender movement and there were people saying that you can choose your gender. You could be a man or a woman or you could mix and match. This didn't occur overnight. This was a result of a lot of events that took place in Europe. As I mentioned, the Reformation in church and lots of other revolutions and reformations. But one hallmark is the idea of individualism. This occurred in Europe where individualism was taught. What does it mean? What is individualism? Individualism says that you as an individual, you have the right to pursue your own happiness. Don't let society tell you how to be happy. Don't, your, don't let your parents teach you how to be happy or how to be happy. Pursue your own happiness. Do whatever it takes to make you happy, even if it means going against social norms. Even if it means going against religious norms. Do whatever it takes. Nothing else matters. Not your children, not your parents, not your grieving mother, not your suffering father. Even if they're crying and wailing for who you've become, that doesn't matter. Because at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it's your happiness. So do what makes you happy. So if you're born a female, but you don't conform, you don't identify with the female gender, with, the, with being a woman, you could be a man. You could be whatever you want. You don't want to be a, a man or a woman? That's up to you. That's fine. Because it's all about individualism. It's all about individual happiness. Who cares about others? Your neighbor, your friends, your family? Doesn't matter. It's your happiness. Do what makes you happy. Of course, this can also teach us to be very selfish. Some aspects of individualism, I'm not saying that it should be completely rejected. There's no harm in pursuing individual happiness, but it doesn't mean that I harm and I hurt others or I break laws or I go against nature. I go against science, right? Sometimes individualism can make us be selfish, selfish. You know, there's a lot of good aspects about Western culture. There's a lot of good aspects, but there's also a lot of negative. The idea of per pursuit of personal happiness, individual happiness, even if the entire world burns down, but you should be happy. This could be very selfish. I pursue my happiness, but I make others unhappy. I destroy others. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes, my dear friends, we have misunderstood happiness. Sometimes in order for me to be happy, I should make others happy. When I've made others in my life happy, I'm happy. This is how we work as human beings. If I've made my family members, my wife, my children happy, that makes me happy. The idea that let everyone burn, but I pursue my own happiness, that's not real happiness. That's an illusion of happiness. Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now you see that they offer various categories. The transgender movement, they offer various categories. For example, there is a gender, a gender, someone who has little or no personal connection with gender. Are you a man? No. Are you a woman? No. There is bi gender, someone who identifies with both male and female genders. You ask them, are you a man? Yeah. Are you a woman? Yeah. How does that work? Works. I'm bi gender. And then there's gender fluid. Someone whose gender identity or expression varies over time. So in March, he's a man. In April, he's a woman. In June, he goes back to becoming a man. Gender fluid. There's gender queer. Someone whose gender identity falls between or outside of male and female. Somewhere in between. Or maybe even outside. There's intergender. Someone whose identity is between genders or a combination of gender identities and expressions. And then there's pan-gender, and the list goes on. And it doesn't end. You can't even keep up with them. There's so many categories that they're putting out there, you can't even keep up with them. It becomes chaotic. Every day there's something new. There's a new form of identity based on your feelings. Now, what is the problem with all of this? Someone might say, Sayyid, that's it. 
What's the big deal? A person who feels like a man today, next week, can claim to be a, a woman. What's the big deal? Let them be. If it's about pursuit of happiness, if, if, if it's about the pursuit of happiness, if that makes them happy, let them be. Why stop them? Why try to argue against? I'll tell you why. You know why? Because this leads to chaos. This leads to chaos. This gender fluidity, identifying with a different gender every day, this leads to chaos. One day in the morning, you choose to identify as a man. In the evening, you choose to identify as a woman. And that's very much legal and valid. Isn't that chaotic? In the morning, you're one gender. And in the evening, you're another gender. In the morning, you go to work and you use the men's bathroom. By the time you want to leave, you're using the woman's bathroom. Why? Because early in the morning, you're a man. Late in the evening, you're a woman. In the morning, you're the husband of the family. At night, you're the wife of the family. Because you've become a woman. You identify as a woman. Does that make sense? Isn't that chaotic? How is this supposed to work? How is society supposed to accommodate you with all of these changes? Isn't this chaotic? How is your family supposed to accommodate you? Your woman, your wife, your husband, your children, your family. How are they supposed to accommodate you and cope with you as you pick and choose every day and you identify with a different gender in the morning, in the evening, at night? That's very chaotic. Also, how are others supposed to be accommodating? For example, you're a woman. You're a woman. You're a female and you're a woman. You go to the restroom and you see, you go to a woman's restroom and you see a man. And he's using your restroom. Why? Because he's identifying as a woman. How are you supposed to feel? Where's your personal happiness? How come when we talk about personal happiness, we're only talking about this person who identifies or he keeps on changing. What about others? What about other people's happiness? I as a man, I go to a restroom and I see a female. I see a woman that's identifying as a man that wants to use the same restroom or same shower. You go to the gym, you're using a, a shower and you see a, a female or a male that identify with the opposite gender. How, that, how is that supposed to make you feel? How are you supposed to be happy? You see? It's chaotic. It's chaotic. I remember in Michigan, in the United States, in Michigan, at a mosque, there was an incident. One day during Salatul Jum'ah, during the Friday prayers, a man or woman, I don't know, came into the mosque, but he had a beard, but with a headscarf. And he went and he sat with the woman, in the lines of the woman, in the back during the khutbah and during salah. Now, according to Islamic law, if a man stands with women in the same line in salah, it what? It invalidates their salah. Tayyip, what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to accommodate such a thing? He has a beard, but he has a headscarf, and he's saying, I'm a woman. I'm a woman. How do you argue against that? Tayyip, and not only that, but he was using the women's restroom. And there were women without their hijab wanting to perform wudu or wash their hands or face or whatever. And there's a man claiming to be, or he's saying, he's saying, he's identifying as a woman. How do you deal with this? This is a challenge. These are some of the challenges that our fathers and forefathers never had heard of. And I would have never imagined that such a challenge would be for Muslims in Canada and America and the West. Imagine if you go to the airport and you're about to travel, you're about to go, go on a flight and you have to pass through security, right? In the U.S. we call them TSA. I don't know what they call them in, in Canada. You're passing through to TSA and you're randomly, right? You're randomly chosen to be searched and the person, and you're a female, you're a woman, you're a Muslim woman, and you're chosen to be searched by a man that identifies to be a woman and he wants to search you. And he wants to pat you down. Why? Because he, he's identifying with a woman. He says, I'm a woman. Allow me to pat you down. How does this work? How is this supposed to work? How, is, how does this make us feel as Muslims 
as people that are religious, my dear brothers and sisters, there are others coming in. I ask you to scoot. Just scoot. You don't have to get up. Just scoot towards the front to make room for the ones that are coming in. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad three times. You're a doctor. You have your office. You have a patient that comes in. You as a Muslim doctor, you have a patient that comes in who you see them there. It's a male or a man, but identifies as a woman. What do you do? Or the other way around. She's a woman, but she tells you I'm a man. She identifies as a man. That's how she feels, right? That's how she feels. She feels that she's a man. But how do we cope? What do we do in that sort of situation? This all leads to chaos. This all leads to chaos. One minute you identify as a man, another minute you identify as a woman, and then you, you keep back and forth. How are you supposed to keep count? How are you supposed to keep count? This all will lead to chaos. And this means the end of gender, the end of men, and the end of women. All of this will end. There will be no such thing as men anymore and no such thing as women anymore because it's all gender fluidity. And that is very difficult to swallow. That's very difficult to keep up with. This also means that this is the end of the family unit as we know it. A family that compromises of a father and a mother, this will end. This will all end. Because now you could have two mothers or you could have two fathers. My dear friends, this is not society that's telling us. This is science. This is science. This is fitrah. This is nature. That a family needs a husband and a wife. A family needs a father and a mother. And they both have roles. This is science. They both have roles. A father has his roles. And a mother has her roles. And they complete one another. They complete one another. The roles are complementary. The father maybe lays down the law. He's a bit rough when he needs to be rough. The mother is more calm, more comforting, more relaxed, more compassionate. Of course, these are generalizations. It could be the other way around. They say, Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Rahmatullah alayhi, a shaheed he had made a deal with his wife that I will be the compassionate one, I will be the lenient one, and you can take, and you can lay down the law. I want to be the, you know, the good cop, bad cop, I want to be the good cop. And you could be the bad cop if you'd like. And he had that role, and that's fine. At the end of the day, there needs to be two roles, the role of the father and the role of the mother, and they complement each other. This is necessary. This is what science teaches us. It's natural. This is natural. It's not that society taught fathers what to do or taught mothers what to do. No, this is natural, right? Have you seen single mothers? Just ask single mothers how difficult it is to raise children on their own. Whether they're divorced, a single mother could be divorced, or the husband lives in another area for some, for some reason. Do you know how difficult it is? Why? Just ask them. They'll tell you because I have to play the role of the mother and the father. Is this society? Is this a social construct? Because society is telling them play the role of the mother and the father? No. It's natural. It's, it's human nature. The single mother has to play both roles. She has to act as the mother and the father in the, in the absence of a father. For her children. Or in the absence of a mother, the father has to be, to have two roles. The role of the father and the role of the mother. Tayyip. What about animals? We human beings, we're part of the animal kingdom. At the end of the day, we're animals. Right? Some more than others. But at the end of the day, we're part of the animal kingdom. What about animals? When haven't we heard of scientists, they tell us, for example, lions, everyone loves lions, right? 
until we're eaten by them. But everyone loves lions. They're fierce. They're brave. Haven't we heard that scientists say that male lions typically behave in one way and female lions typically behave in another way? We've heard this. If you've taken zoology, if you've gone to a zoo, you've heard this. That animals, the different genders and animals, the different sexes, they behave differently. Males behave in a different way. Females behave in a different way. Who taught them this? The society of lions? The society of, of animals? This is nature. Nature, or they would call it mother nature, taught them to behave in this way. This is not a social construct. It's science for the males to behave in one way and for the females to behave in another way. This is science. Why does it come when it comes to human beings? We say, no, 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 no. Gender is a social construct. It is society that teaches men how to behave and women how to behave. And it's not science. Isn't this a contradiction? Isn't this a double standard? What about nationality and race? Do we have nationality fluidity or race fluidity? For example, today I'm Iraqi and a week from now I go to Pakistan and I love Pakistani culture. I love Pakistani food. I claim I'm Pakistani. Khalas, I'm Pakistani. And then the next month I go to Germany and I claim that I'm German. Why? Because I feel I'm a German. I feel I'm a Pakistani. And then I go to India and I feel I'm an Indian. Does, is that how it works when it comes to nationality? It works that way? Depending on what I feel, what I identify with. If I, you know, I identify with Norwegians. Does that make me a Norwegian? Am I entitled to a Norwegian citizenship? It doesn't work that way. Not with nationality, not with race. Yes, I may align myself with Pakistani values. But I can't say that I'm a Pakistani and no one would accept me unless I was born to Pakistani parents or I develop a Pakistani citizenship. I go live there and they give me a Pakistani citizenship. I don't know what they are not, I don't know. But to claim to be something, a nationality or a race, just because I feel it, it doesn't mean it happens. What about age? What about age? I feel like I'm a 20 year old. Does that make me 20 years old? Is that how it works with age? Just because how I feel. I identify with 20 year olds or a 25 year old. It doesn't work that way. Otherwise you'd see a 60 year old man saying I'm 16. Knock off the zero, put a one. Instead of 60, he's 16. Khalas, he feels like a 16 year old young man and he's entitled to be that way. Why? Because he feels it. That's his identity. Does it work that way? Where do you draw the line? If we were to base gender on feelings and identity, what I identify with, where do you draw the line? What if someone, God forbid, says, I'm an animal. You know, I, I like to be a kangaroo, depending on your favorite animal. I'm a kangaroo. Does that entail him to get government funding to transform into a kangaroo? Does this make sense? Where do we draw the line? Because if you go in this path, there's no ending. Because tomorrow, there will be another movement, and another movement, and another movement, saying that it's all about what I feel. It's all about what I identify with. And that's where chaos comes into play. See, it becomes chaotic. There's another problem. The transgender movement and those who argue for gender fluidity, they fall into a contradiction. What is that contradiction? They say, for example, she says, I'm a female, but I identify as a man. I was born as a female, but I identify as a man. I tell her, what do you mean? What do you mean that you identify with a man? She says, I feel like a man. I want to wear a suit. I want to wear a tie. I want to wear pants. I want to be masculine. I'm not going to cry. I don't want to show emotions. I'm a man. So, Ajib, but aren't these signs, aren't, isn't this a social construct? Isn't this what society teaches men to be? I thought you said that gender is a social construct. 
but now you want to identify with a specific gender, a gender that society taught them to behave in a way, or a man says, I identify a male identifying with the female, with the woman gender. He says, I'm a woman. Well, what is a woman? I want to wear a skirt. I want to wear a dress. But didn't society tell a woman to wear a dress? I thought you wanted to reject what society says. I thought you said that this is a social construct and we shouldn't care for what society says. I should do what I please, what I feel, what I ident identify with. At the end of the day, you're going back to society. You're, you're going back to that social construct that you were running away from. You see the contradiction? This is a major contradiction. My dear friends, at the end of the day, feelings do not determine reality. How I feel today or tomorrow, it doesn't, ident it doesn't define reality. What defines reality is nature. What defines reality is science. This is common sense. Science defines reality. Science says this person is a male, and hence he's a man. Science says this person is a female, and hence he's a woman. That doesn't depend on feelings and whims and how I feel. It doesn't work that way, because that will keep on changing. Today you feel something, tomorrow you'll feel something else. It doesn't work that way. And then, as I said, where do we draw the line? If we don't draw the line somewhere, it will create chaos. Absolutely. طيب. What does Islam say about gender? Does Islam recognize genders? Does Islam recognize the sexes? What does Islam say about this? First of all, Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran repeatedly in several verses mentions that we have created you from males and females. Ya ayyuhan nasu, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ O oh people, we have created you from males and females and we created you from clans and tribes so that you may meet, so that you may work together. The most honorable amongst you are those that are pious, the most pious. In another verse, Allah says, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ إِنِّي لَا أُضِيعُ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِّنْكُمْ مِّنْ ذَكَرٍ أو أنثى أم سلمة, the wife of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله she told him, Ya Rasulullah men have a lot of opportunities for getting thawab they go to jihad they do a lot of things where they get thawab what about us? what about us, women? do we have thawab as well? do we have rewards as well? Allah reveals this verse, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ أَنِّي لَا أُضِيعُ عَمَلَ عَامِلًا مِنْكُمْ I will not forget the deeds of all of you, ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى Men and women, males and females. Islam recognizes the genders. وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَاءَكَ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ وَلَا يُظْلَمُونَ نَقِيرًا those who, good who do good deeds and have faith from men and women shall enter paradise and shall not have fear. Thus Islam recognizes that there's two genders and there's two sexes. There's males and females and there's men and women. Yes, there's a third gender that Islam also recognizes called khuntha or known as hermaphrodites. And they have their own laws. In books of fiqh, when it comes to salah, ghus, there are special deeds where hermaphrodites, khuntha, they have their own laws. And for those of you that are interested, you can refer online to books of fiqh and you'll read about their laws. That's a third gender known as al-khuntha. And of course, there is a debate that is khuntha a third gender or is it a mix? Or is it a mix? Because a khuntha has reproductive organs of both genders. So is it a third gender or is it a mix of both? That's another topic. But at the end of the day, there's two genders. Two. Two genders. Male and female. Men and women. That's it. This is what Islam recognizes. This is what the Quran recognizes. Not only does the Quran recognizes, recognize the two genders, Allah celebrates the two genders. Allah celebrates them. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nas, ittaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. O people, be pious of Allah who created you from a single 
So, وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا And created from that soul, its pair. وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً And from these two souls, male and female, Allah created lots of men and women. You can't go wrong. If الذكر والأنثى means male and female, رجال ونساء means what? Men and women. Allah recognizes these two genders. And Allah is proud. Allah celebrates this creation that He created men and women. There's no other gender. This is science. This is fitra. This is nature. This is not a social construct of having men and women. Yes, some roles can be dictated by society. We don't argue with that. Some roles. And it depends on which society you come from, which community they come, you come from. Maybe they have some expectations of men, they have some expectations of women. Some of these roles, some might come from society, but the actual dichotomy of men and women, this is natural. This is science. It's not something that we can question and say that there's various genders. Also, Allah Azza wa Jal assigned certain obligations to, to the two genders. For example, men, men they have been assigned to jihad. Jihad is mandatory upon men, not women. Salatul Jum'ah is mandatory upon men, not women. Of course, women could attend if they'd like, but it's not mandatory upon them. It is mandatory upon men. Spending on a wife, that is mandatory upon men. Some rituals of hajj are mandatory upon men and not of women. For example, the the two pieces of ihram. This is mandatory upon men, not upon women. For women, for example, their obligation is hijab, and so on and so forth. Allah Azza wa Jal designated special obligations for the two genders that they have to obey. You cannot pick and choose. In Islam, your sex is your gender. Not that you have one sex, but a different gender. Your sex is your gender, and you can't pick and choose. That is your identity. For example, you can't say, well, I'm a woman, but when it comes to polygamy, I'm a man. I want to be a man when it comes to polygamy. I want four spouses. In this case, I want to be a, a man. It doesn't work that way. Or when it comes to hijab, I'm not a woman. I'm a man when it comes to hijab. But when it comes to not praying for five days out of the month, for example, no, no I'm a woman. Now I'm a woman. Why? Because you don't get to pray for five days out of the month and you don't fast for five days out of the month. It doesn't work that way. When it comes to divorce, I'm a man because men are able to divorce. When it comes to marjiya, I'm a man. It doesn't work that way. You take your designated obligation because that is natural. That is what science says. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. What about gender roles, my dear friends? Does Islam accept gender roles? Has Islam prescribed roles for men and roles for women? And are those roles a prescription? Is it an advice? Is it a recommendation or is it obligatory? My dear friends, Islam recognizes that men and women are different. Men and women are different. This is something natural. This is something Normal, physiologically, psychologically, mentally, men and women are different. Men and women think differently. And their bodies are different, their organs are different. This is something normal. This is something natural. And Islam recognizes this. But is there a gender more superior than the other gender? Absolutely not. Are men superior to women? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Men are not superior to women. And nor are women superior to men. Islam recognizes the differences but without choosing one over the other. Yes, Islam has prescribed certain responsibilities and duties to each gender. For example, when it comes to men, Islam has made men caretakers of women. Men are caretakers. It is their obligation, their responsibility to take care of their men. There are some people they misunderstand this verse. They say, Men are supervisors. Men have an authority over, over women. Who told you it's an authority? 
Who told you it's an authority? Qawwamun does not mean authority. It doesn't mean authority. It means they're caretakers. Qawwam in the Arabic language, for example, this building, this building has a qawwam. Qawwam is a caretaker. Someone who takes care of the building, makes sure that everything runs smoothly. Doesn't mean that he has authority over the building to do whatever he wants and come and kick us out, for example, in the middle of the majlis. No. al qawwamun ala nisa It means that men are caretakers of their women. They take care of them. They spend on them. They protect them. That is the job of a man, to protect his family, to protect his wife, to protect his children, to care, to care for them, to provide for them. That is the mean, and that is an obligation. As for women, do women have obligations? Here, my dear friends, see, Islam does recommend for women to take care of the house. But this is not an obligation. Islam does not make it an obligation for a woman to take care of her house. Islam here says, for the happiness of the family, take care of the house. Take care of the house. Take care of the chores. Take care of the family. But this is not an obligation. So if she doesn't cook, it's not haram upon her. If she doesn't clean, it does, it's not a haram upon her. This is a role that is recommended, advised by the sharia. It's not mandatory. While for a man that doesn't spend on his wife, he'll be held accountable. That's an obligation. It's not a recommendation. Also, my dear friends, you see, in Islam, a husband and a wife can come to terms. They can have an agreement. Although Islam prescribes and recommends for the man to do the working, to work outside of the house, and for the woman to take care of the house, but this is a prescription. This is a recommendation. If the husband and wife arrive at a different agreement that satisfies both parties. For example, of a family, if the husband can't work, he loses his job. He loses his job. He gets laid off. And we saw a lot of this, especially during the pandemic, where the husband was laid off. So he decides to stay home. He has a joint decision between the wife and the husband. She goes to work and he stays home to take care of the children. Is this haram? No, this is not haram. No one says this is haram. Does Islam recommend this? No, Islam does not recommend this. So we have to draw the line. Is it recommended? No. But is it haram? Are you breaking any laws? No, you're not breaking any laws. Why? Because for a man to sit at home, it goes against his nature. Men, there is self-worth in working and providing for their family. And providing, going out, sweating, working hard. As I said in the beginning of the lecture, sometimes even if you're not comfortable, but you're making everyone else around you comfortable and happy, that makes you happy. And this is one thing about men. Men, when they make their family happy, when the family is comfortable, even if they have to go through hard work, right? But they're comfortable out of, at the end of the day. If his wife is proud of him, he's happy. If his children are proud of him, he's happy. That's why Islam recommends for men to go out and work. But at the end of the day, they can reach an, ag an agreement. The husband and wife can reach an agreement that which satisfies both parties. Islam here is lenient. Islam here, when it comes to family laws, it doesn't stick things on stone. You can reach your agreement. Here, we see Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam with his wife, Fatima al-Zahra. They had an agreement. This agreement worked for them and it works for a lot of people. A lot of people, Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra made an agreement that Amir al-Mu'mineen would take care of everything outside of the house. Fatima al-Zahra would take care of everything inside of the house. And they had a lovely family. They were happy and they raised the best of children. It was the happiest family ever. They had an agreement. They divided the roles, they divided the tasks and everyone was happy. We come to Karbala. We see that in Karbala, there were men and there were women. And both had their own roles. And they both completed each other. They had complementary roles. You know, when we, we sat the ziyar of the shuhada that sacrificed their life for Imam Hussein alayhi salam, بِأَبِي أَنْتُمْ وَأُمِّي طُبْتُمْ وَطَابَتِ الْأَرْضُ الَّتِي فِيهَا دُفِنْتُمْ But their wives, they played an equally important role. Some of the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, maybe some of them might have been reluctant into entering the battlefield. Why? Because at the end of the day, he has a wife. He has a mother. He has children. 
to care for, to nurture, right? But when the wife steps up and she says, my husband, enter the battlefield. My husband, the same way that you'd like to make Aba Abdullah proud, I'd like to make Fatima al-Zahra proud. She had her role. If it wasn't for the woman in Ashura, there would have been a different scene. It was the woman of these Ashab that come forward and they encourage their husband to enter the battlefield and don't worry about us. Don't worry about us. We have Allah. But you go and do your obligation towards Imam Hussein. Go and shed your blood, sacrifice your blood for the sake of Allah and for this man, Aba Abdullah al Hussein. As for us, we have someone to take care of us. That was the role of the woman in Ashura. And if it wasn't for this role, it would have been a different scene. There were men and there were women and there were children. You have from the elderly, Al Habib ibn Mudahar, who we will talk about in a couple of nights. You had young men, you had middle aged men, you had young men. You had teens, you had children, and you had infants as well. There were even infants on the day of Ashura. These were roles. They all had their roles. Imam Hussein السلام, had his role to make that sacrifice and to stand and to shout and to make a, a stand. He stood fearlessly, saying that I will never choose humiliation over death. I would rather die a thousand times rather than to be humiliated, to give bay'ah to someone like Ibn Ziyad, whom he doesn't even know who his father is, Ad-Da'i ibn Ad-Da'i. Who was his mother? Marjana. Who was his father? Who was his father's father? No one knows. Ala wa inni la ara al mawta illa sa'ada wal hayata ma'a zalimina illa barama. I see that death is happiness. For me, death is happiness. This is the role that Imam Hussein played, and there was another role by Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. To deliver his message. If it wasn't for Sayyidah Zainab, the message of Imam Hussein would have vanished. <coughs> but she kept the message alive from city to city, from place to place. She kept the message of Imam Hussein alive. This was one of her roles. And the other role was to take care of his orphans, the children, the daughters of Aba Abdullah. She had made a promise to Imam Hussein السلام, to take care of his orphans to take care of the women and children after him. On the night of Ashura, he made this vow to her and she accepted and she told him, Satajuduni and the Husnavan Nikabi. Ya Ba Amdullah. Inshallah you will find me meeting up to your expectations, Ya Ba Amdullah. Now come with me tonight when we remember one of the daughters of Aba Abdullah, one of the martyrs, Ruqayya bint al Imam al Hussein. Come with me to Sham, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's pay a visit to a small tent, a kharibah in Sham when Yazid was in his palace drinking, getting drunk, and the daughters of Aba Abdullah were gathered in a small tent. The daughters crying, the children crying. Sayyidah Zainab السلام, would go from woman to woman, putting her to sleep. Sleep, my daughter. Sleep, my sister putting them all to sleep. Sayyidah Zainab would be the last to sleep and the first to get up. Going from child to child, from orphan to orphan, from woman to woman, putting them to sleep. Finally, as Sayyidah Zainab came and she was about to put her head to sleep next to Ruqayya, three-year-old Ruqayya, as soon as she put her head to sleep, all of a sudden she heard Ruqayya, Amma, Amma, my father is coming, Amma, get up. Get up, let's clean our tent. My father's coming. Let's put things into order. We have a guest coming. Amma, <laughs> 
نذير نذير عندي لو أبويا زارنا Sayyidah <laughs> Zainab told her, my, my knees, let me sleep, let me sleep, go back to sleep, Ruqayya. She said, no, auntie, my father is coming, I just saw him, he's coming back, we have guests coming. Zainab kept on begging her, go to sleep, Ruqayya, no, no, no. She got up and the entire tent got up, everyone crying, everyone shedding tears. The news reached Yazid and his palace. What is going on? What is the commotion? <coughs> they told him one of the orphans of Aba Abdullah woke up in the middle of the night. She saw her father and his dream and she's asking for her father. He said, La ba's, la ba's, He said, take the head of her father to her. They brought the head of Aba Abdullah in a dish covered they bring it to the tent they give it to Ruqayya Ruqayya said I'm not hungry I did not ask for food I'm asking for my father bring me my father they told her what you're asking for is in the dish she lifts the lid and she sees the beheaded her father's head in that dish من الذي خضب الشيب العفيف من الذي أيتمني على أصغر سني My father who dared cut off your head My father who drenched your blessed beard in blood My father who made me an orphan as a young child, she kept on shouting, Abba, 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 until finally Ruqayya goes quiet. Ruqayya calms down and goes quiet. Everyone thought that Ruqayya had fallen asleep. Imam Zain al Abidin looks at his aunt Zainab. She says, Amma Zainab, Ihmali Ukhti, lift my sister. As they lift her, they see that Ruqayya had died. Ruqayya had gone. Imam Hussein had taken her. ويهيج لوعتي ويزيد همي علي لك من يدير العين لي لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون Raise your hands in دعاء نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العلي الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرم يا الله اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا عيبا إلا سترته ولا خوفا إلا آمنت ولا رزقا إلا بسطت ولا شملا إلا جمعت ولا مرضا إلا شفيته ولا غائبا إلا حفظته وأدنيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين ولأرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والعلماء والشهداء نقرأ سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات